So our speaker today, I'm very um, pleased to welcome Professor David Taylor. Uh, he's from <laughs> so David is um, from the National University of Singapore. Um, he's based in the Department of Geography. Um, and he um, has got a broad range of experience in the tropics. He started off doing his PhD um, in um, Eastern Africa um, and then moved to um, National University of Singapore, what, 20 years ago, was it? You were first then. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and then, then moved back to, um, to Europe. He was in uh, Brace at Trinity College, Dublin, um, um, around, for around about, what, 16 years or so? And then moved back to... Um, Singapore for um, about four years ago. And so today, um, David, David, I think, is going to talk about some of the work he's been doing on a, a large EU-funded project, um, looking at the links between climate change and vector-borne diseases um, in the tropics. So I look forward to hearing uh, what David has to say about that. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Uh, just a quick announcement. Uh, I am not Bruce Willis. Um, anybody who may have... Uh, I thought I was an imposter. Um, what I'm going to do uh, this evening, I'm going to talk about some work that I've been involved in over the last six years or so. So I started out doing my PhD, as Suzanne mentioned, in Uganda, actually. I was very much an earth scientist. I was looking at climate change in the past and its impacts on vegetation, fauna and flora. Uh, and in particular, looking at uh, its impacts over the last 40,000 years years or so. So I was very much a kind of geologist type earth scientist, uh, not too bothered about the present, more interested in climate change in the past. But my experiences in, in Uganda as a PhD student in the, in the 1980s uh, really kind of caused me to think about the implications of what I was doing and the results that I was generating for the present day. And that got me into thinking much more about the human dimensions of environmental change and human dimensions of climate change in particular. So I was kind of thinking about, about these things in the 1980s, and it was very difficult to find other people who had similar interests, because there wasn't much interest in climate change in general back in the 1980s, and in particular there wasn't much interest in climate change in the tropics. I mean, most people in, up until the, the late 1980s assumed that the tropics climatically were relatively stable and had to experience anything like the kinds of vicissitudes and conditions that uh, were evident in more temperate parts of the world where the glaciers and the like. So that got me interested. So I was interested in the human dimensions. And about seven years or so ago, there was an opportunity to apply for funding from the European Union to look at uh, some of the climate change impacts and their implications in the developing world. So I became uh, part of a group of people who were looking at the health impacts of climate change, and in particular the health impacts of climate change in uh, Eastern Africa. So Uganda is part of Eastern Africa, but more broadly in that region. When that project finished about a year ago, uh, I continued working on that project whilst I was uh, here for the first few years in, in, in Singapore. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about that project uh, and some of the deliverables from that project, some of the results of that, of that project. Because uh, the project was not just about the science, it was also about translating the science into policy and trying to have, trying to have some impact on policy, impact on decision makers who were making decisions about where very scarce resources made available for health ought to be uh, placed in the future. And of course, that was quite difficult for us to do, and I'll talk to you about some of those difficulties that we had. Okay, so just to oops. okay, just to put this in, in some kind of context, we all know, I'm sure, uh, that climates have changed and are and are changing. These are quotes and, and data from the most recent IPCC report, the fifth assessment uh, report that came out. Uh, 2013, 2014, we're familiar with this, these statements about parts of the world being warmer over the last 30 years and have been for, for many, many uh, hundreds of years. Uh, we're familiar with these kinds of uh, hockey stick type diagrams that show changes occurring, occurring much more rapidly 
uh, towards uh, the present. And we're also familiar um, with the idea that conditions are likely to change into the future. And again, these are uh, statements and figures that hopefully you're uh, already familiar with. They're from uh, the IPCC's most recent report, this fifth assessment report. And so these are projections of temperature change into the future and um, precipitation change into the future. And according to these projections, of course, the world is project projected to get warmer over the coming decades. And it feels pretty warm at times in, in KL as, as it does in, in Singapore. Um, project projected to get warmer in the future. And parts of the world are going to warm more quickly than other parts. With regard to, to, to rainfall, it's a much more kind of patchy uh, projection in terms of there isn't really the same kind of trend evident in the projections. There are some parts of the world are going to get wetter, other parts of the world uh, are going to get drier. The contrast in precipitation between wet and dry regions and between wet and dry seasons will increase, although there may be regional exceptions. This is a quote uh, from one of those IPCC uh, reports. So although projection of, of future climate change is an uncertain science, we have quite uh, a lot of confidence in the projections of change in temperature, less confidence in projections of change in precipitation. Uh, but actually, it's not really the projections in, uh, or the change in temperature, change in rainfall so much that are of a big concern. It's their impacts. It's their impacts on sea level. It's their impact on agricultural productivity. Uh, so it's not so much the change itself, it's the impact of those change, those changes. And actually, we're much more unsure about what those impacts uh, are like to be. So the impacts of climate change are of greatest concern, but these are even more difficult to anticipate, even more difficult to get agreement on the, than the climate change itself. In Western countries, such as the UK, North America, when people think about the impacts of climate change, people often think in terms of increased storm activity, increased flooding, rises in sea level. And often those hazards are viewed through a prism of impacts on property. Are we going to have houses washed away? Are we going to have uh, damage to, to our infrastructure, etc., etc.? That doesn't appear to be so clear cut when we think about the impacts of climate change in less economically advanced or so called less economically advanced parts of the world. There, there's a much greater concern about the impacts of climate change on people through, for example, reductions in agricultural productivity, increased malnutrition, the impacts of climate change on health. And a recent paper that was published just last year in the journal Climate and Development uh, kind of backed up this suggestion. Uh, according to recent research, uh, 70 to 80% of people surveyed in Vietnam, Indonesia, and Tanzania believe that climate change will negatively impact health. So there's a genuine, uh, general concern. And that concern probably stems from a greater awareness in many less economically advanced nations, which are generally located in the tropics, that there is already a large burden of climatically sensitive diseases. So this is a map that uh, was taken from a paper in Lancet, a reputable journal, published in 2009, uh, published by the uh, Lancet and UCL Institute for Global Health Commission, that was set up just a few years previous to that, to report on the impacts of uh, climate impacts on, on health. One of their conclusions was that in certain parts of the world, that climate change posed the biggest threat to health. 
uh, in terms of uh, future collisions. This uh, map is scaled according to the burden of climatically sensitive diseases. So countries that are, and parts of the world that appear large on this map, such as the continent of Africa, South Asia, appear large because they carry already a large burden of climatically sensitive diseases. Much greater burden than other parts of the world. So Australia, which looks like a, I don't know, a starving dog. <laughs> um, North America, parts of, parts of Europe. Of course, that map, that scaling, is the reverse of the map that would show the global distribution of greenhouse gas emissions. So if the world was scaled according to global emissions of greenhouse gases, it wouldn't be Africa and South Asia, which would appear so large on the map. It would be the Americas, Europe, Australia, parts of our region also. So that's the kind of basis of what's known as climate injustice, which is a big movement at, at present uh, in terms of the countries that are facing the biggest threats from climate change aren't those countries, of course, that are most responsible for anthropogenic climate change. When more developed parts of the world think about the health risks or the health hazard of climate change, they tend to think of the invasion, if you like, of diseases from outside the region. So it's not so much about whether diseases that are already present in Europe or North America are going to get worse as a result of climate change. It's the extent to which these areas are going to be more vulnerable to diseases from places like Africa, Central America, etc., etc. So what concern there is in Western countries regarding the health impacts of climate change tends to focus on the spread of infectious diseases out of warmer parts of the world. So dengue is a good example of that. So this is a paper that was published a couple of years ago that shows the uh, spread and changes in dengue uh, over the last uh, 50 or so years. It's thought that dengue first emerged uh, in Southeast Asia towards the end of the Second World War. Um, it was characterized at that time by maybe two at most <coughs> viral strains. And then over the following years, dengue spread out of Southeast Asia, across Southern Asia, 1970s, it started to reach Central America, 1980s, spread through uh, the Americas, spread into Africa, etc., uh, etc. Et so it was a a spread, but there's also changes in the disease itself. So at present, dengue is now characterized by at least four viral strains, possibly even five as a fifth that's been uh, supposedly discovered uh, in, in our region. Of course, the, the problem there is that um, if you contract dengue through one of these, with one of these uh, viral strains, then you tend to recover relatively easily. And if you then contract a second dengue viral strain, that's when you have the real problem, the hemorrhaging, etc. etc. Chikungunya is a disease that's uh, come to prominence in this region just over the last few years. Chikungunya, first identified in Africa, then in uh, Asia, and now it's being picked up in Southern Europe and North America. Chikungunya is very similar to dengue. Uh, it's, in fact, uh, one of the problems we have in trying to reconstruct the history of chikungunya is that in the past it was mixed up with dengue. So people reporting that it was dengue uh, may have actually been misreporting or misidentifying dengue. It could be chikungunya. And then Zika, of course. Most recently, Zika, first uh, isolated in Uganda from the Zika forest in, in Uganda um, in the 1940s, picked up in Asia in the 1970s, and then in the Americas more recently, 
pushing up into uh, the northern uh, part of uh, North America. Sorry, northern uh, America. What's interesting about these diseases, dengue, chikungunya, and Zika, is that they have the same vectors, the same genus of mosquitoes, the Aedes mosquitoes, and two in particular have been highlighted, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. Aedes aegypti is the yellow fever mosquito, also transmits yellow fever, the disease. Um, albopictus is the Asian tiger mosquito. These are really quite interesting uh, vectors, really quite interesting mosquitoes because they're anthrophilic. They actually like living around humans. In fact, they prefer to feed off human blood than the blood of other animals. They also like living in urban areas. They bite during the day or at night, such as malaria mosquito, of course, bites at, at night. So that means many of the uh, responses to mosquito-borne diseases, many of the interventions that have been used for malaria mosquitoes don't work for these, for these mosquitoes. Bed nets are ineffective, uh, for example. But the same vectors that transmit yellow fever, they also transmit Rift Valley fever, they transmit West Nile fever, etc., etc. These are the vectors that are involved in spreading this disease around the world. And so one of the questions that's being asked is the extent to which that is being driven by changes in climate, driven by, by warming. Because of course these vectors and the pathogens they carry are biological, and so they will, we would expect them to have particular limits in terms of the temperature that they're active in, etc., etc. However, there are some things that make us a bit suspicious as to the extent to which this is climatically driven uh, and the extent to which other factors play a role. So work that's been done on, on, on these vectors suggests that during their lifetime, one of these individuals can fly at most for maybe three or four hundred meters. And so in Australia, I was talking to some people in Australia where they've done some work on, on how far Aedes can actually travel and Aedes adult can actually travel. Uh, and when they release labelled mosquitoes on one side of the road, they found that they've stayed around that location where they've been released and not even crossed the road. So if, not, if a mosquito is willing to cross the road, it's unlikely it's willing to cross the Pacific by itself. So of course that means there's other factors like to, to be involved in this uh, Spread. Another an interesting characteristic um, is that not everybody who's affected by these diseases shows evidence of being affected, shows the symptoms. So that calls into question a lot of biosecurity responses. So with dengue and with Zika, it's thought that about maybe 70 to 80 percent of people who have those diseases don't present any symptoms at all. They don't, they themselves don't know that they have the diseases. They don't feel ill at all. They can still spread the disease, but they don't feel ill themselves. Why is it calling to question many of the biosecurity methods? Well, if you think, protection methods, if you think about when you get off a plane at an airport and they're looking for people who've got these diseases, they're using temperature, if 70% of the people with the disease don't show up on those cameras as being unusually hot or feverish or, or, or whatever, then it's not a very um, useful form of security. It's rather um, uh, a leaky form of security. Clearly there are some climate factors involved. So climate presumably has some role to play in these changes. Actually working out what that role is, is very taxing, and I'll come back to that uh, later on. 
just to, as, a, as an illustration of the link with, with climate, um, this is some, some data from uh, Africa, from West Africa, from Niger. And basically this relates to, to malaria. Malaria is transmitted by another genus of mosquitoes. It's not the same genus that transmits uh, yellow fever and dengue in there. This is the Anopheles uh, mosquito. As with those other di diseases, it's the female mosquito that transmits the disease. It transmits the disease because it needs to feed off blood and it wants to lay its eggs. So it's part of the cycle of reproduction. The female mosquito needs to feed off blood. The male mosquito is kind of quite chilled, it just lives off nectar and, and water and it's, it's uh, um, not harmful to, to humans. But of course, the male mosquito also gets clobbered by all these interventions. It turns out insecticides sprays in them, along with the female mosquito. In fact, it's an interesting um, question in pub quizzes. When pub quizzes used to exist before Google and smartphones, smart, smartphones uh, spoiled all that, what is the most dangerous animal in Africa? Well, some people say lion, some people will say buffalo, and maybe some more knowledgeable people will say hippos. It's of course the female mosquito, an Ophelia's mosquito, that's responsible for about half a million deaths every year in Africa. Half a million, that's two Boxing Day 2004 tsunamis of deaths every year, year after year after year after year. And this is a disease that we know the cause of, we know how to treat it, we know how to prevent it. And it still kills half a million people a year. 90% of those people are in Africa, a high proportion of those people who die are pregnant women and children because of compromised immunity. Anyway. So it's a significant disease. The reason I'm kind of stressing that now is I'll come back to that at the end of the uh, presentations. These data from West Africa, uh, basically they show, uh, this is the annual precipitation level, uh, averaged over this period 2001 to 2003. Uh, these are weeks, so week one, beginning of the year, up to week 52, the end of the year. And it shows that there's a a peak, a single peak in rainfall. So in this part of Africa there's a single wet season. These other curves show incidence of malaria in the same part of Africa. And these are people who've tested positively through blood tests for the disease malaria. And you can see it has the kind of same shape, but there's an offset. So does anybody know what caused that offset? So there's clearly some kind of link between the two, but it's not a direct link, there's a, an offset. Why do you think that is? Is it because after the rain, the water that is standing, the mosquito breathes into the water? Exactly, yeah. So this is a kind of the clue here, is, is here. So this rain is not driving the disease itself, it's driving the habitat for the vectors the vectors that carry malaria. So when we have peak rainfall, a few weeks after that peak rainfall, when surface water has uh, formed on the ground for a couple of weeks, new mosquitoes begin to emerge, and after a period, start to feed, start to look for their, the females start to look for their, for their blood being. So there's an environment link, climate link, but it's not direct, there's an offset. But there's a suggestion that it can be modelled. A suggestion that it can be modelled. And that's actually been the basis for some early warning systems that have been set up. Maybe it's malaria early warning systems that have been set up in, in sub Saharan Africa. This is from uh, Madeline Thompson's uh, paper in Nature, 2006, where basically they used seasonal forecasting of rainfall as a predictor of malaria epidemics. And you can see from this uh, work here, so in southern Africa, which is where this paper is, is, is based, particularly wet during El Nino years. And that's when you 
tend to get large, abnormally high numbers of malaria cases. It's epidemic conditions, in other words. And during La Nina, the opposite part of the cycle, there's lower rainfall, and that's when we tend to get these lower um, numbers of malaria cases. So this is a system that's been set up for Botswana and other parts of, of Southern Africa, and other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa have also set up similar seasonal forecasting systems. One of the problems, however, is the fact that despite this work is published in Nature, policymakers don't tend to read Nature, they don't tend to read the scientific literature, so although we have these malaria early warning systems in place, they don't tend to get used. So when a malaria epidemic hits, that's when the health services start to, to react rather than being proactive and like perhaps anticipating uh, these events. <clears throat> I mentioned that, that climate is not the only factor, of course. There are other uh, contributing factors. Those contributing factors, along with climate, act as part of a complex, what's being called a pathogenic landscape. It's that landscape which basically determines whether you or I contract a disease. So that pathogenic landscape is formed by factors such as levels of immunity, our, our access to health facilities, the extent to which we travel around the world, the extent to which we come into contact with people who've travelled around the world. So travel is now seen as being a major driver of dispersal of these diseases. So these hotspots for epidemics and new emerging diseases often quite closely linked to foci of travel, major airports, etc. Et so this is a, a map of distribution of uh, these are um, flight paths uh, that have been uh, taken over a, a period of a year, I think it is. Uh, and they just show where the major flight paths are, but also where the major parts on the Earth's surface where planes come into land. Uh, and these parts of the, of, of the world are often associated with uh, disease uh, foci. Other uh, contributing factors are things like urbanization, living close together, um, pollution, so plastic rubbish is prime mosquito breeding habitat. Uh, so we're extending the habitat range of mosquitoes every time we dump rubbish and don't uh, deal with it properly, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So it's these pathogenic landscapes which effectively convert the hazard of a disease into the risk of disease, the likelihood that we're actually going to contract the disease. This complex relationship that includes climate but also comprises other factors is not new, it's long been known. So this is a quote taken from uh, an archival record from Kenya. Uh, so part of the, the project I was involved in, I'll say more about later on, the project I was involved in looking at uh, climate change impacts also looked at climate change impacts on health in the past. And that involved a lot of archival research uh, in uh, Eastern African countries, but also in London and places like that. This, this is a quote uh, related to this issue about climate being one of the complex of factors influenced in health. We know that malaria epidemics result from a more than normally widespread production of Anopheles gambi, that's the Anopheles mosquito, that in Eastern Africa is largely responsible for malaria transmission, which in turn is made possible by ample rainfall. So this is the 1940s. But ample rainfall is not always followed by epidemics. There was a realisation then that rainfall was involved in some way in malaria transmission, but it didn't necessarily determine malaria transmission, but these other factors. So these are some data from Swaziland in, in southern Africa. It's an upland part of, of, of southern Africa. Um, these were published by Packard in 1984. Uh, these are basically uh, malaria data 
uh, superimposed on malaria epidemic data, superimposed on rainfall data for the high and uh, middle uh, belt. So sorry, the low belt and the, and the middle belt. So this is the rainfall in the higher part of uh, Swaziland, and this is the rainfall in the lower part of um, Swaziland. And you can see there are cases where epidemics of malaria, marked by these vertical lines, coincide with high rainfall levels. But there are also cases, such as these two have been highlighted, where epidemic malaria occurs when rainfall wasn't anomalously high. So what appears to have uh, happened here is that these epidemics occur the year after years when there's been very low rainfall. So in most cases the kind of expectation holds that epidemics occur when you have high rainfall, but there are cases where epidemics occur in the year after a severe drought. Why do you think that might be? Anybody? So after the drought, uh, when there's a rainfall, which is not really high, but they will get the resource to break, maybe? They get the resource to break? Okay. Yeah, it could be. Um, Packard interpreted, so Packard was a colonial officer, a retired, went back through all the colonial health data in Southern Africa. His interpretation, it sounds plausible to me, is actually during these periods of very low rainfall, the preceding year of very rain, low rainfall, there's not much agricultural productivity. So people are malnourished. There's not much food for them. Many people are at their most vulnerable to diseases when they're malnourished. That has implications, of course, for the impact of future climate changes on agricultural productivity. But also at this time, when, when major droughts occur, that people who maybe worked on farms where their productivity had dropped had to move off the land. They had to move to areas where there was work or where there was still some agricultural uh, productivity uh, for them to get in, in, involved in. So, oops, sorry. So Packard interprets these uh, periods as epi these epidemics that occur in low, probably low rainfall years, as due to malnutrition, but also due to people having to move. And the significance of that is that you have people with malaria, ha perhaps moving into areas where people didn't normally experience malaria. So people moving from lower altitude parts of Swaziland, moving up into the higher altitude parts, where people were naive to malaria. And of course, if you've not been exposed to malaria continuously, you lack immunity to malaria. So you're much more vulnerable. Malaria, in those situations, has a much greater epidemic potential they might otherwise have. And actually, people lose their immunity to malaria relatively quickly. So if somebody's living in an area where malaria is endemic, every year they're exposed to uh, malaria, if they survive their childhood, then they probably have some immunity to, to malaria. Otherwise, they wouldn't have survived their, their childhood. If they move out of that area, say to go to work, whatever reason, when they come back, maybe after only two years, they have lost that immunity, that acquired immunity. So these are much more vulnerable um, to this. I'll come back again, that's another issue that I'll come back to. I've got loads of issues that I'm going to come back to at the end of this uh, talk, but I hopefully I'll, I'll remember them, them all. But anyway, the point here is again, it's rainfall, but it's not just high rainfall. It's also low rainfall, completely disposed populations to, to disease. <clears throat> so climate plays a role in transmission. It's a complex role in itself. So there's complex factors, and it's also a complex role that, that, that climate plays. 
Why might we want to try and understand that role better? Well, one good reason is that if we can get a hold on the component of disease, of these climatically sensitive diseases that's attributed to climate, then we can say perhaps a bit more about what the future might hold for these diseases under certain climate change scenarios. The second reason is if we have a clearer idea of the role that climate plays, that allows us to understand better the success or the level of success of interventions. What I mean by that is that, so for example, with dengue, there might be a concern about dengue. The government might invest millions of dollars in an intervention to try and reduce malaria or, or dengue or whatever disease. And then when it looks back on the results of that intervention, if it doesn't take into account variability in climate conditions in the meantime, it could come out with a very wrong assessment of the success otherwise of that intervention. And that has actually happened. So I just want to quickly go back to this. So there have been cases in Africa where governments have celebrated that the intervention of bed nets has caused a local elimination of malaria. Malaria is gone. And so there's been a kind of complacency as a result, people have stopped using bed nets, and malaria has come straight back again. And it's now thought that actually it maybe wasn't the bed net, that intervention that led to a reduction in malaria. It was just that the rainfall wasn't sufficient to sustain a high level of malaria. And once that rainfall situation changed, more rainfall led to more malaria, then there's all these people who were no longer using bed nets then uh, experience the, the disease. So it's quite an important point, and it's a point that's often overlooked. So trying to understand the impact of climate on diseases is not about not just about projecting what the future might hold, it's also about trying to understand better the present. And that's a really key uh, point. When it comes to, to this kind of work, one approach that's been used over the last couple of decades, which has been very influential, is that of basically species or niche modelling. And that's where a disease is basically viewed in the same way as a plant or animal species that has a particular habitat that can be de described by particular climate variables such as rainfall, uh, temperature, etc., etc. And once that relationship is understood, then it's possible to kind of model that relationship into the future or to look at uh, current conditions. Of course, there are big problems with that approach because the disease is much more complicated than a particular species. But it has led to some quite impactful uh, maps and publications, etc. Et so this is a paper from 16 years ago now in science, which adopted this kind of niche modeling approach to looking at the possible impact of future climate change on malaria. So basically what was done was that the current distribution of malaria was assumed to be largely climate determined. That's a bad assumption to make as we already have discussed. That those, that, those climate parameters that determine the distribution could be worked out. And then the impact of projections of future climate change, in this case using HADCM3, global climate change models, could be looked at in terms of change in the distribution of malaria. And then all you have to do is compare the projected distribution for the future with the current distribution. Um, and that allows you to, like a simple overlay analysis, allows you to highlight areas where malaria might disappear from because it 
it was too warm for the mosquito vector, or too warm for the pathogen, but also highlights areas where malaria might move into because temperatures in those areas become warm enough to support the mosquitoes and support the pathogen. And this work has been quite impactful in the past, um, despite all the um, weaknesses in the approach. One of those weaknesses, and I think it's kind of underpinned a lot of misunderstandings about the possible impact of climate change on diseases, is that the complex effects that climate change may have, not just on the distribution of diseases, but also what happens to diseases within their distribution. So for example, if we look at the effect of change in temperature on the female mosquito, as it gets warmer, the reproduction cycle gets shorter. So the female mosquito needs to feed more frequently as temperatures warm. So if the female mosquito needs to feed more frequently, then there's a much greater chance that it's going to pass on pathogen from malaria or from dengue or from whatever, to, from an infected person to an uninfected person. So it's going to spread the disease more quickly. So it's not just about changing the distribution of the disease, it's also about changing the distribution, changing the disease within its distribution. And they're not picked up by niche uh, modeling. So this is again a paper from Science from three years ago. Climate change does not simply affect the distribution of transmission of climatically sensitive diseases, but also causes increased transmission cycles, causes uh, instability of transmission. All these things lead to a greater epidemic potential within the area in which the disease is already found. And I think this is a major gap in our understanding here, or our awareness, because much of the attention is focused on spreading out of diseases out of areas where they exist at present into what were formerly areas too cool or too dry to support these diseases. <coughs> Much less attention has been paid to what happens to diseases like dengue and malaria and chikungunya and zika within their current areas of distribution as a result of changes in climate. Potentially, those impacts are far greater than those the impacts of those distributional uh, changes. <clears throat> so I mentioned those kind of, um, very simple niche species models, which basically relate the distribution of disease to climate variables. And they assume that disease is largely determined by, by climate. Of course, there's a great weakness to that, as I've mentioned, that weakness can be exposed if you just think about malaria. The turn of the 20th century, malaria was a global disease. It occurred in the UK, it occurred in Europe, it occurred in temperate parts of the, the world. It doesn't occur in those areas now, not because of climate change, but because of change in housing, change in sanitation, increased uh, improvements in public health, etc., etc. However, that doesn't that undermines the niche modeling approach, but it doesn't undermine modeling in its entirety. And there are now new types of, of models, new types of modeling approaches that we can use. One of them is the dynamic disease model approach. The dynamic disease model approach doesn't just model the distribution of the disease, but models the actual behavior of the disease. Not just related to climate variables, but related to things like host density, immunity, travel, etc., etc., etc. We also now, of course, have access to huge amounts of data, big data. You can't go to a seminar without somebody mentioning big data, so I've just mentioned it for you to uh, tick that box. Uh, new abilities to spatially model big data and to incorporate these uh, dynamic models. So we move beyond this kind of deterministic modeling to much more sophisticated uh, forms of, of, of modeling. So this is a paper that was just out earlier this, 
year 2016, in Trends in Parasitology, uh, which emphasizes this, this point, um, that we are in a position now to treat this issue in a much more sophisticated way. And that was basically what underpinned this project that I was involved in um, for four years that finished at the end of 2014. Uh, projects called Healthy Futures it was funded by the European Union. Um, it was funded to the tune of about 4 million uh, euro. And that sounds a lot, but there were 16 partners. Eight of those partners were based in, in Africa. So when it's spread out amongst a large number of part uh, partners, it's not much money to go around. We focused on Eastern Africa, um, countries of Kenya, Uganda, where I did my PhD, Rwanda, Burundi, and Tanzania. Actually, I wrote the uh, application, this application whilst I was on sabbatical in Rwanda. Um, I decided to, the, the challenge of writing an EU application wasn't quite big enough, so I decided to take myself off to, Uganda, to Rwanda, where there was very little internet, very little access to printers and things like that uh, to write the, the proposal. But it clearly worked, because of course all those are just distractions. I was able to actually focus on the, the problem uh, whilst in Rwanda. There was no other things, or very few other things to, to focus on. Anyway, so the, the, the work that we are um, we're doing basically targeted three climatically sensitive uh, diseases. Uh, malaria, which is a huge burden in the area. Schistosomiasis, which is a, uh, a, a nematode um, that uh, also has a very high morbidity in the region. Uh, and Rift Valley Fever. Rift Valley Fever is uh, a disease that's also transmitted by the same vectors that transmit uh, dengue and um, chikungunya, etc., etc. It's a zoonosis, so it's a, it's a disease that can jump from animal, non-human animal species into humans. So it predominantly affects livestock in this region, but it also can spread beyond those livestock to cause death for, for humans who pick up the, the disease. It doesn't just affect any livestock, however. It's a very clever disease. It only affects introduced livestock. So it affects those animals that have been introduced largely from Europe and North America as part of attempts to intensify agriculture in this part of the world, intensify uh, raising of livestock in this part of the world. Uh, when it does have a, uh, an effect, it has major economic consequences because people can't use the meat, they can't export the meat, they're export bans, etc., etc. So it's economically a major disease in the region as well. And then we wanted to um, understand links between these diseases and environment, climate in particular. We also wanted to think about the problems of the disease, these diseases when seen against the vulnerability of the populations that were going to be or were being exposed to these diseases. So we we're not just looking at the hazard of the diseases, we we're looking at the risk. We we're looking at these other factors that contribute to this pathogenic landscape in terms of determining the likelihood of people contracting the disease. And as I also mentioned at the beginning, we wanted to use the results of our research not just as a way of increasing our numbers of publications in scientific journal articles, as certain scientific journal articles, but also as a way of influencing policy. And so the four-year project, throughout that four-year project, we were involved with working with health workers in the region, health decision makers in the region, trying to get our findings incorporated into their um, strategies for the future. One of the outputs uh, was this website, the data uh, and modeling portal, which is freely accessible. It's called the Healthy Futures Access. I use this in my teaching in, um, in NUS. Uh, basically, it provides a means of modeling the impact of climate change on these three diseases in Eastern Africa. And looking at the differences in impact according to different climate change uh, scenarios. 
So we use these RCPs, which are the climate change scenarios that are part and parcel of the uh, fifth assessment report. We focused on RCP 8.5 and RCP 4.5, uh, in particular, are four uh, scenarios that are used in the, or referred to in the fifth assessment uh, report. So if you go to this website, you can access this. It's freely available. So what we wanted to use this, we wanted this to be a research tool, teaching tool, but also a tool that can be used in planning as well. So what does it comprise? Well, this actually summarizes four years of research by about 40 uh, researchers doing work on the Healthy Futures uh, project. So for each of the diseases, we have mapped vulnerability to those diseases. So th these maps were produced as a result of discussions with experts in the field, what makes people vulnerable to malaria, for example, education, access to health, whether you're pregnant or not, etc., etc. Um, it also incorporates these new dynamic uh, disease models that we developed through the project and we published uh, separately so they're accepted. So these are, are models that actually model the behavior of the vector and the pathogen and the host as a result of changing in environmental and uh, economic conditions. And we drove the models of these diseases with downscale climate change projection data for the region according to these two scenarios. And again, just to emphasize that we didn't use the lowest RCP, um, which is the best case scenario. We used 4.5 and 8.5. There's a reason why we didn't use the 2.5. The 2.5 is basically the scenario that assumes, or is based on the assumption that we respond positively to the threat of climate change, we do something about it, we cut our emissions, etc., etc. We didn't use that. We used the next best case. Why do you think we didn't use RCP 2.6? As with all of these decisions, there was a process that went through long negotiations with experts in making that, that decision. Why do you think? It's really, it's a kind of, cast a, a really interesting light on the whole climate change negotiations and debates, actually. So the reason we didn't use RCP 2.6 is one of the positive responses to the threat of climate change, concerns of climate change, that's built into this scenario, is the development of biofuels. And the replacement of fossil fuels by biofuels. Brilliant. If you live in London, or Stockholm, or wherever, New York, or Singapore, where are those biofuels being grown? Many of them are being grown in Africa where they're taking out agricultural land in already the world's most hungry continent to provide fuel as a replacement for fossil fuels for the rich parts of the world. So we had a real problem, a real dilemma. How could we possibly say that RCP 2.6 was the best case example when it was actually going to screw millions of people in Africa, make food insecurity in Africa a much greater problem than it already is. So that's why we decided on 4.5 rather than 2.6. And then we uh, used the modeling work combined with vulnerability assessment to project not just change in the hazard of the disease. So through that portal, that Atlas Health Futures Atlas portal, you can actually look at the hazard, changing hazard, the projected hazard of the disease as a result of projected change in climate. You can also look at projected changes in the risk. And this is the likelihood that you're going to be infected by this disease in the future as a result of climate change. So this is for Rift Valley Fever. Again, I don't want to spend very much time on, on this. But just to show that this is basically the distribution of Rift Valley Fever uh, in Africa at present. It's largely concentrated in eastern and southern Africa, although there have been outbreaks in the Middle East and in West Africa, Senegal. Uh, it was first recorded in the Rift Valley 
1930, hence the term with Valley uh, fever. So most of its distribution has, most of the outbreaks have been in the Rift Valley. Uh, but our projection was a risk that only picked up the Rift Valley as, as being uh, an area of continued risk of this disease into the future, but it also picked up Rwanda and Burundi and parts of western Uganda as a risk of this disease. These are areas where Rift Valley fever hasn't been reported to date, so not only are people naive to the disease, but health workers are naive to the disease. Veterinary scientists are naive to the disease. But it's also part of the world where there's been a strong push for replacing indigenous livestock with high yielding livestock from Europe and from other parts of the so-called developed world. So there's a policy here of the one cow per, foot per poor family that's in Rwanda that's been pushed by the Rwandan government. People are donating their Frisian cows in Europe to allow people in this part of the world to have access to meat and milk and other dairy products they would otherwise like to do. These are the vectors in effect, these are the host animals for Rift Valley fever. So again, this is all being done um, without kind of full knowledge or thinking about what the future might hold and the, the change in climate condition. Okay, I just wanted to finish off by mentioning the Paris Agreement because it does have implications, I think, and it wouldn't be fair to talk about climate change in the future without mentioning the, the Paris Agreement. So many of you will be familiar with the Paris Agreement. It was signed um, at the end of last year in Paris, surprisingly enough. Uh, it's also known as Le Cour de Paris, but I guess you're not, not so familiar with that term because it's more difficult to fit the Eiffel Tower in, uh, when, you, when you refer to that term. But anyway, the COP21 agreement is the replacement for the Kyoto Agreement. It's actually the fourth major climate agreement, international climate agreement. The first one was in 1988 that set up the IPCC. The next one was in 1992, wasn't it? Really, it set up the uh, United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change. 1997, Kyoto, 2015 Paris Agreement. A lot has changed since the IPCC was set up in 1988. The world's changed. The economies of, of the world has changed. Think how much this region has developed in, in that time. We're now living in the time that the first IPCC assessment report made projections of. So we're now living in the climate that was projected in the first assessment report back in 1992. Actually, the conditions are worse than projected. The conditions we're working in, uh, living in now, are worse than projected in 1992. It's different from the Kyoto because no longer are there culprits and victims when it comes to climate change. So no longer is it the developed world that's the culprit and the developing world that's the victim. There's a recognition in the Paris Agreement that we're all in this together, that we're all contributing to climate change. The target of the Paris Agreement basically is that emissions are cut on a voluntary basis, not just by Annex 1 countries, not just by developed countries, but by all countries around the world, that those emission cuts are voluntary, and that we, as a result of those cuts, keep climate change to within a safe margin. So it also acknowledges that we are basically committed to climate change into the future. And therefore there's an emphasis on adaptation along with mitigation as a response to climate change. For me what's significant, or one of the points that's significant, is this idea of safe climate change. So safe climate change is presumably a relative concept. What's safe in London or New York or wherever in economically more advanced countries may not be so safe in other parts of the world where people are perhaps more vulnerable to climate change. 
So the current view of safe levels is to try and keep climate change within 2 degrees C or less of warming. That's a global average. That's quite a substantial climate change, actually. When we compare our present global average temperature to the global average temperature at the peak of the last ice age, what difference do you think there is? How, in terms of global average temperature, how different is the global average temperature? Four degrees. Three to four degrees. So when people talk about, I, like, I used to work in Ireland, whenever people mention, you know, it's going to get warmer by two degrees, people say, great, two degrees, I don't have to I can wear shorts more often. Right? You know, in Singapore, people talk about, oh, I just put the air conditioning up a bit more. That's not how global temperature works. The Earth system is a much more, it's a really sensitive system. It only needs a few degrees C of change to have massive consequences. Three or four degrees C less in terms of global average temperature compared with the present, and we're into another ice age. And there's a kilometre of ice above New York. Those are not comfortable changing in climate. With regard to um, this idea that 2 degrees, or even 1.5 degrees C, which is like our best hope, maybe we can keep it to 1.5 degrees C if we try, try really hard. Even that's significant in parts of the world other than uh, richer countries, perhaps. So this is just a, this is my last slide, this is just to demonstrate that fact, or that possibility. So this is basically uh, a map uh, sorry, a graph that shows the distribution of population in Eastern Africa. So that same region that the Healthy Futures Project uh, was located. And it shows differences in levels of population according to different altitudes. Most people in this region live between about 1,400 metres and about 1,900, 2,000 metres. To some extent, that's a disease avoidance strategy. Over time, people have moved to these higher altitudes to avoid diseases that are associated with lower altitude parts of the region. That's not occurred very quickly, of course, it's over hundreds of years of time scale. This uh, line here, this green line here, basically models the relationship, this is based on real data, real malaria incidence uh, data, this models the relationship of the occurrence of malaria with altitude. And basically, at lower altitudes, you have a much higher prevalence of malaria than at higher altitude. And that's because as you get moved to higher altitude, it gets cooler. Mosquitoes don't bite so frequently. The mosquitoes can't survive when it gets really cool. The pathogen can't survive. So you have mosquitoes, but you don't have the pathogen, etc., etc. What happens under a warmer world, even if that average global increase in temperature was translated exactly into this region, is that this line moves to the right. In doing so, because it's getting warmer, that means the malaria vector and parasite can survive at higher altitudes, it brings into contact with the disease, it exposes to the disease many more people. Many of those people are not familiar with malaria. They're naive to the disease. They lack immunity. So there's much likely, much greater likelihood that if they get malaria, they won't die from it unless they can get to a hospital or a health centre. Because it will be serious malaria that they will contract, which will look like a serious malaria. With a one degree C rise in temperature, you're exposing more, 100% more people to malaria. With a 2 degrees C, you've got this very simple model, with a 2 degrees C increase in temperature, you're exposing more than 200% more people to the disease. Many of them will die if they get malaria. So this is a disease that already impacts half a million people in sub-Saharan Africa. Many, many in this, this region. In fact, Uganda has the highest incidence of malaria anywhere in the, in the world. So this is not safe climate change. For some people, this is extremely dangerous climate change. 
I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Sorry, I went on. Maldunican shirt. Thank you very much, David. I mean, that, that's a fantastic example of interdisciplinary research that is also, you know, has great impact and relevance. Um, and I've got um, a couple of questions before we start um, get kicked off. And, and the first thing that um, was kind of occurring to me just towards the end of that is, um, has there been any, any examples yet of? of, of Showing the disease mapping upwards at the, at the present time. Okay, so the, you, you hear a lot of anecdotal um, evidence of, of, of areas now uh, experiencing diseases that, that didn't in the past, that determine whether that's due to climate or whether it's due to other factors. Because, of course, over the last 20 or 30 years, this part of the world that I've worked in, particularly in Eastern Africa, has also experienced major economic changes, generally negative. So there was a whole period of structural readjustment that took place in the 1980s and into the 1990s. Basically, the IMF and World Bank encouraged African nations to spend less on government services, including health. And as a result of that, there's been a massive uh, increase in many diseases, um, including diseases like schistosomiasis, which is one of the three diseases that we looked at, but I didn't really talk much about it. Um, and, and, and the other thing that was uh, that kept occurring to me was um, just wondered about your thoughts on pesticide use, basically, and what the current status was in, in thoughts. Yeah, well, you, see, you might be aware that there's, there's, a, there's been an idea that, that uh, the birth defects that have been associated with Zika. Um, some doctors in, in South America have claimed might actually be due to pesticides that have been used to uh, try and eradicate the, the mosquitoes. Uh, and certainly, in, in, um, Eastern Africa, where DDT was used quite extensively up until the 1960s, um, stopped being used because of the kind of health concerns and the broader environmental concerns. But the rebound in, in malaria, the, the increase in malaria that's occurred in the last few years, some people have su suggested because pesticides have been used to the same uh, extent, in particular DDT. Because there are pesticides that are being used, but much less potent. So there's a, there's a kind of double whammy there. There's a, there's, to some extent, pesticide use and change in pesticide use might have um, caused change in the disease in terms of increase the disease. Uh, but in other cases, maybe some diseases are linked to the actual use of, of pesticides anyway. So, I mean, one of the big problems in, in, in Africa is that, and it's here as well in, in Asia, when it comes to pesticides, is that there's a building, build up of uh, resistance to pesticides and indeed build up resistance to the drugs that are used, the chemotherapy that's used to try and combat malaria and, and, and other diseases. And part of the reason for that build up um, the resistance is the irresponsible use of, of, of drugs which are used to treat diseases like malaria and the like. Actually the area of Cambodia and, and, and Thailand is, is, is an area that's associated with the build up resistance to malaria drugs, the prophylactics that, that and also the drugs that they used to treat malaria. And that's part, it's still one of the reasons for that is that people, if they've got malaria, especially if they don't have much money, rather than buying the full course of malaria or taking the full course of, of malaria tablets, um, they'll stop taking the tablets once they feel okay, uh, rather than go to the end of the, the course. Yeah, like you, yeah, yeah. yeah, like uh, yeah. yeah. It's a classic, and that's how you get the immunity. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's how you get the resistance building up. And actually, it's interesting that Thailand and Cambodia, globally, is regarded as a place where that's quite common. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, shall we open this up to the audience then? Anyone got, got a question for David? Thanks, David. Um, at some point, you mentioned about the need for translation of science results to the, yeah. the, the government and policy makers. And all. Can, can you say something about the, the progress or any any um, 
benefit that your project Healthy Future has contributed and making something change to the people in, in the region? Yeah, that's a really. I was hoping I was going to ask that question actually, because I, I know I wouldn't have time really to go into it in very much detail um, in my presentation. But actually, we had a big problem throughout the project trying to get uh, decision makers interested in the in the research. I and mean, one of the reasons for that is the decision people who make decisions about health. They're making lots of decisions. They're very busy people. We're actually getting them to sit down and try and get them to listen to what you've been doing and why it might be important to them is itself quite difficult. But we had a really revealing meeting in Nairobi about two years into the, two and a half years into the project. And we had uh, quite a few representatives of health ministries. Actually, we had two ministers of health involved directly in the project. That they were actually uh, provided staff who were working on the project. But at this meeting in, in, in Nairobi, we've gone through like a whole couple of days of presenting results from the uh, project. And of course, it's like a typical scientific meeting, lots of detail. We have people talking about models, computer models, and uncertainty. As soon as health uh, decision makers heard the word uncertainty, they, they kind of like switch. Like, if it's uncertain, they're not interested. But basically, it's because they didn't understand what we were meaning by, by uncertainty. Anyway, so we managed to kind of bring them back on board again by explaining what we what exactly meant by uncertainty. But at the very end, the people there who were from the ministers of health said, look, we're not interested really in all this science stuff. It's, it's, it's really useful. It's, you can see it's really good work. Can you summarize it for us? And so I, as the leader of the project, I said, well, what kind of summaries do you want? So we were working on three diseases. And uh, we were told that our summary should be no more than one page for each of those diseases. And I just thought, you know, this, I, I don't know how many tens of years of scientific endeavor gone into this project, and, and we have to reduce it to three A4 sheets of paper with a nice infographic on it, because they probably can't even bother to read a couple of paragraphs of, of text. But once we realized that, then we found it kind of better to engage, easier to engage. Well, they are really busy, and they don't read journal. And many of them don't come from a science background or a health background. Surprisingly enough, people who did economics at university or politics at the university, and they're quite high up in the health ministry or, or whatever. So we did have problems, and I don't think we came anywhere close to achieving what we wanted to do. But I think we made some progress. And I think the whole kind of discussion about climate change and its implications for health in sub-Saharan Africa has changed now. So I was at the COP meeting in, in uh, Durban in 2011, and apart from myself, I was the only person who was speaking about at that meeting about health impacts of climate change. But now it's much higher on the, on the agenda. And I think, I wouldn't say that our project has, has had much of an influence on that, but I think in combination with other projects and, and, and other news items and, and, and the like, people are much more aware of Hi, I would like to ask, uh, what's your recommendation in terms of like uh, combating these diseases? Uh, since like for example in a small scale, uh, in our university there's fogging, but there are still like many cases happening, so do you think like there's any recommendation to combat this uh, health disease climate change related? Yeah, I mean, I'm very sceptical of, I mean, fogging <laughs> takes place in, in many parts of this, this region. Um, I think if you look at where the big improvements in public health have been made, it's not been through this kind of chemotherapy type approach involving drugs or insecticides or, or whatever. It's generally been in improvements in sanitation, it's been in improvements in drainage, it's been in improvements in just not accumulating the same kind of waste uh, that, we, that we tend to accumulate. So kind of fogging is 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 never going to deal with the, the problem because the problem needs to be dealt with its source. And, and often that source is these other fa factors of, of, of life that we seem quite happy to, to continue. So I think I mean, fogging presumably has a a very slight palliative effect, but it's not going to stop dengue. It's a tiny, tiny effect. You know. And of course, we know that that uh, fogging kills lots of other things that might actually themselves feed on mosquitoes. 
that's the predators of the mosquitoes get killed as well. Uh, and it also leads over time to resistance, and so you have to use even more horrible chemicals. Um, um, I was just wondering your thoughts on um, the genetic modification of mosquitoes to deal with them, and kind of like uh, maybe the eradication of uh, certain dangerous species by making the males infertile and things like that. Yeah, so I, again, I'm really skeptical about that. Um, I think you can probably have a local effect on the local populations, but some of these mosquitoes are now so widely dispersed. To have a, a kind of a, a impact across the range would be a huge, hugely expensive endeavour, and have all these other consequences of, as, as well. I mean, one of the problems is that the way that I think we view these diseases, because it's not the mosquito that is born with the disease. The mosquito is just involved in its transmission between animals uh, and other animals, other kinds of animals. And actually, all of these diseases uh, started off with even malaria was originally thought a disease of other kinds of animals that jumped into humans. Uh, and diseases like dengue and zika and chikung chikungunya are probably first acquired by humans through the process such as deforestation, through eating bushmeat and not properly treating etc. etc. Um, so again, it seems, to me it seems rather sad that we target the mosquitoes if the mosquito is something evil. It's just living its life basically. <laughs> and then finally. Well they are annoying of course, but then there are people who are annoying as well. We're not going to eat the <laughs> Um, so, in your opinion, are we saying the mosquito is successful because it's a mosquito, or does it have an X factor, or it's just because of human negligence? So, there are many, many species of mosquito, and we tend to view mosquitoes as um, some kind of like tropical insect. But actually, more temperate parts of the, of the world have lots and lots of different kinds of, of, of mosquitoes. Scandinavia, if anybody goes on holiday in the summer to Scandinavia, it's virtually impossible to walk around because of mosquitoes. Uh, so the mosquito itself is a very, very successful organism. And one of the reasons for its success is it's highly adaptable. It's a very diverse uh, group of organisms. They can inhabit most areas. If they can't inhabit particular environment, then they can change their behavior so that they can adapt or cope with that environment. So for example, Anopheles mosquitoes that transmit malaria, Anopheles gambit, which is the big transmitter of malaria in Africa, which has very distinct, very clearly defined thermal limits, is in London. It's in the underground. It lives in the, under, in the, in the London underground where it's warmer to support off the gambling mosquito. It doesn't transmit malaria because there are, there are not many people in London who carry malaria. But if there were a large population of people in malaria in London with malaria, then those off these gambling mosquitoes could pass that malaria on to, to other people. Um, so there, there are a whole range of reasons for the success of, of mosquitoes. But they're not a it's an important I'm not saying you're suggesting this at all, but they're not a tropical uh, group of organs and they globally in their distribution. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a follow up question. Thanks for the interesting presentation. Uh, my question is more on this science policy interface. I mean, uh, the question is not about GM mosquitoes. Actually, in Malaysia, we did field trials. And I think policymakers are bombarded with conflicting science, is it? As far as I know, there are biological controls to these mosquitoes, like Bacillus thuringiensis and all these kind of microbes that we can use. But I think policymakers are confused because there are scientists who are pro pro pushing for the introduction of GM, and there are also scientists who are pushing against GM. Yeah. That's the first question. What, what should we do? Is it? The second part of the question is, I think in international diplomacy, especially in climate change, we know economic prevails. And I always notice that the interests of economically uh, superpowers tend to prevail. And these kinds of science where we realize that even two degrees might not be the right figure for some some communities do not seem to be in that stage, you see. So I noticed there's like 
an absence of science, although we have IPCC, but there just seems to be that absence of science. And in the recently concluded EPES, if you might have known, there was also this whole contention about the science, is it? who sponsored the research and all these kind of things. So, your views on this. Thank okay. you. So, there's three questions there. Yeah. The first one about uh, biological control, I and mean, I guess one of the reasons why uh, policymakers are reluctant to implement particular scientific results or whatever in terms of biological control is this idea of unintended consequences. I mean, the possibility that they might be creating a whole new raft of problems as a result of biological control. I mean, there's been many, many cases around the world where attempts at biological control have actually made, if not that situation worse, another situation that turns out to be even worse than the one that's, that's been used to. So I guess that's why there's that uh, sensitivity. Um, with regard to the, um, this idea about uh, not enough science. I, would tend to, I think I would disagree with you. I think the science of climate change is pretty well sorted. I don't think there's much real debate about the science of, of climate change. I think what the media has not served that community, the, the climate change science community particularly well. They've been very keen to pick up on the kind of oddities that arise. So a particular scientist has not done very good work or they've been funded by an agency that's not objective or whatever. Or in some cases it's, it's, it's almost been inadvertent. So for example when the IPCC releases its report, the IPCC reports are not a report from one person. They're the considered opinion. It's the result of the period of consideration and discussion involving thousands of scientists. Not all of those scientists believe in climate change. There are climate change skeptics amongst those IPCC. And so as a result, the actual IPCC conclusions, etc., tend to be much less extreme than the views of many scientists working in, in the field because they take into consideration these other views. And so there's this you know, negotiation and, and, and as a result, compromise. Uh, but what happens then is that the media, when these reports are released, they always say, oh, we've got IPCC persons to talk about uh, um, the, their report. In order to be balanced, we're going to get some complete wacko to talk about why we shouldn't believe in climate change science. As if it's like one person who believes in climate change science and one person who doesn't. And you have to be balanced to, to provide both views. The IPCC has already considered all of these other, these full range of views as well. And so that gives the general public the wrong impression. It's as if the, the IPCC is some kind of climate change wacko, and they're going to be, their views are going to be compared with this climate change skeptic wacko, and, and, and make up your own mind. And of course, they're the public, 50 50 probably, probably going to go one way or, or the other. And I think that's a misunderstanding of what the IPCC, I mean, these reports take years to, to, to produce. And it's not just people who are in favour of climate change and contribute to those reports. That's not the case at all. So that's what was the other one, sorry. The other... I think you covered it. Oh, okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a, a quick one, uh, curiosity actually. You mentioned earlier that um, this diseases like dengue and all these uh, things that started out in tropics and the range is getting bigger, so the concern in the West is that these diseases will eventually reach them. Yeah. So I was just wondering whether it's anything the opposite, as in any diseases in the West that we should be worried about yeah. here. That's a great ask question because I, I, I wanted to talk about that as well because we don't have time. But of course there are diseases of the West that we are very vulnerable to. And the West doesn't mind exporting at all. Things like <laughs> diabetes. <laughs> Obesity. It you know, doesn't mind selling all these products and processed food and things like that. This, this lifestyle that leads to these diseases, um, whilst at the same time being very happy to try and put barriers to prevent diseases of, as they're perceived from the tropics moving into these other countries. I had a really interesting uh, conversation a few years ago with the head of research in the Ugandan Ministry of Science, and I said, you know, what, in your view, 
are the major diseases that Uganda is going to face looking for, into the future. He didn't say HIV AIDS, he didn't say malaria, he said obesity, he said diabetes, he said all these diseases of sedentary, urbanized lifestyle, eating lots of processed food, not exercising, etc., etc. He said that the big challenge that we have is that the provision of health services in a country like Uganda is donor driven. So it's driven by the European Union, it's driven by North America, USAID, etc., etc. And he said it's actually impossible to get funds from these organizations to research or look into the, these diseases of obesity and diabetes. Uh, because where these donor countries get their money from, the taxpayers, they're quite happy to see starving Africans, but just can't come to terms with the fact that actually you might have overweight Africans who are suffering from diabetes and they might need particular help in the future, etc. etc. So there's a real dilemma. And, and of course it's kind of like the Bill and Melinda Gates and vertical health programs looking at uh, trying to eradicate malaria, eliminate malaria and HIV AIDS and, thing, and things like that. They're not helping the situation either at all. So yeah, so yeah, the West is exporting diseases and it's much less concerned about that than it is about importing diseases from the parts of the world. Oh really? <laughs> Hi, uh, my question is about the predators, the animals that feed on the mosquitoes, and how the high uh, times of uh, rain and uh, drought, how does it affect their rate of feeding on the mosquitoes and their behavior? Yeah, it's a really good question. Well, I, I've not done any work on, on, on that at all. Uh, I mean, there's a whole, you know, because the, the, the fungal infections, which are climatically sensitive, etc., etc. It's not just the other animals that, that, that feed on them. I mean, one of, the, one of the things about mosquitoes is that they do appear to be quite quick in adapting to, to change the in, in conditions. So there's evidence in parts of Africa where bed nets have been introduced and the mosquito and, and malaria has fallen off for a couple of years. And that, that might be due to full changing in rainfall, as I mentioned. Um, but then the malaria has come back again whilst people have still been using the bed nets. And it seems that the malaria mosquito has changed its feeding pattern. It no longer feeds at night, it feeds during the day. It doesn't feed close to the house, it, feel, it feeds when people are in the, in, in the fields. So, the, so the, kind of, the significance of that is that perhaps there will be a period where because the mosquitoes can change much more quickly than the species that prey on them, that there may be a short period where they have this massive abundance of, of mosquitoes as a result of plant change before they're kind of predators in the other organisms that keep their numbers at reasonable levels at you know, the possible altitudes, for example, have time to catch up. So that is one possibility that has been suggested as, as, as well. I mean, we, in, in more temperate parts of the world, we're familiar with the idea that as a result of warming, say, fish that lay their eggs earlier because of warmer water, when those fish eggs hatch, the juvenile fish have no food to feed on because the food that they would normally feed on hasn't yet grown uh, because it's occurred, that process has occurred earlier in, in the year. So. But someone just said that you're from Uganda. Yeah. Which part of Uganda? Uh, I used to live in Kampala. Okay. What about in Kampala? Uh, I used to live uh, around a place called uh, Mbuya. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know I do very well. Yeah, yeah. I used to live uh, in Bugalopi, which is right yes, yeah. Very close to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Small world. Small world, yeah. <laughs> there was a big army barracks there, is that where it is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. So, yes. Following up on the science to policy interface, um, we come up from this, this massive effort and the 60 years of, of you know, uh, science, human science, and uh, 
so then you're having to summarize this in three, eight, four, eight, eight <laughs> years, right? So then, uh, reflecting on all this, I uh, look at the future and you know, advising to other other academics. So then, how can the academic community do a better job? So we we do all this science, which is the basis needed to be very high quality. But how can we do? How can we do a better job in in moving beyond science and having an impact? So then, for example, if you have a big team like, like you had. Uh, would you include non-scientists to do the connections part of the team from, from day one, or you would engage with external partners that will do this? And how is the reception, for example, from by the donors? Are donors happy with that, or are the universities happy to have you have this as part of the KPIs or the outputs? There's some reflections from science. Again, really good question. I mean, that last part of the question for me was kind of really important as well. Uh, I think if scientists are going to have greater impacts beyond their publications in, in their um, work, then universities have to change. Universities have to start to recognize the kind of wider societal impact of, of, of what we do beyond publishing in, in journal articles that the only people who read those are often other scientists. Um, so that's where the change has to come as well, I think. And that was one of the frustrations that, that we had, that we were going away from these meetings saying, basically, what we've been producing, a lot of interest to our universities, that's how we get promotion and things like that, it's of no importance to the people on the ground. And something has to, to, uh, has to change. And that realization came quite late in, in, in our project. I think if I was starting the project again, I would involve non-academics right from the very outset. I would involve representatives of civil society, NGOs. We did involve people from, from the health ministries, but Generally, there were people who had a scientific training because it was thought by the Ministry of Health that these were people who could understand what we were doing and therefore you know, they were the people to work with. Actually, it would have been better to have people who didn't understand what we were doing to work with. So it would have forced us to actually explain better what we were trying to do and to make sure, right from the earliest stages, that their needs and, and, and uh, weaknesses, etc., etc., et were taken into consideration at the beginning. So I think it's a kind of I know there are some scientists who think we should just stay clear. It's not our job to inform policy or, or whatever. And I think that's fair enough if there are you know, people like it. I and mean, I think the way the universities are present in parts of the world is structured. That encourages that kind of, uh, it certainly doesn't discourage that kind of behavior. But for me, I find it really rewarding, though, as, as, as well, working on this project and trying to get relatively complicated ideas uh, across. And even just raising awareness about things like climate change and um, politics of climate change, etc., etc., climate justice. Okay.